Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Matamor Cronin, and today we are discussing part one of a two-part series. In part one, we'll be exploring the future of life on Earth. And next week, in part two, we'll extrapolate further to explore the future of life beyond Earth. Our special guest for this two-part series is Michael Kipp. Kipp is a biologist and Earth scientist who is currently finishing up a PhD at the University of Washington. His research focuses on the long-term co-evolution of life and its environment across Earth's history. He's also a good friend of mine. We were roommates all through college at Notre Dame. We were both classicists. We both went on archaeological excavations in Boutrin. We've traveled to many other parts of the world together, and I couldn't think of a better person to bring on the podcast to talk about how Earth went all the way from when it was originally born up until how it may inevitably die. So, Kip, it's a pleasure to have you on. Oh, thank you for having me. Happy to join. Awesome. So before we get into those super interesting, crazy questions like how it's all going to come to an end and what we as humans are going to do about that, let's first start with how Earth came to be in the first place. So can you shed some light on, you know, how does a planet form? What determines whether a planet is formed or a star is formed? and, And how did Earth come to be in the first place? Yeah, so that's a great place to start. Um, What we currently know about the way that planets and also just solar systems form in general is that they form at the same time. That's to say that uh, our working model is that there's a basically a cloud of dust uh, that for some reason or another is perturbed. Uh, The latest thinking is that this was uh, done through an adjacent supernova in the early stages of our solar system. And that introduction of some disturbance to this cloud of matter basically causes it to start to gravitationally collapse upon itself. And you can imagine this as a swirling disk of matter with the most mass becoming concentrated at the center. And it exists more or less in a planar fashion. It's a flat disk. And this goes on for a few million years, eventually getting almost 99% of the mass in the center of that disk, which is what becomes a star or our sun. Mm. And out at distances, you actually get very tiny, in comparison to the sun, almost negligible sized uh, pebbly looking things basically, but these are the planets. Mm. And so each of the planets in our solar system formed through the aggregation of smaller and smaller pieces into large agglomerations. And that's how they came to be all orbiting the sun in the same direction. So they were more or less born at the same time as each other, the stars hmm. uh, and their respective planets. That's interesting because when you talk about a swirling disk, the Milky Way itself is one giant swirling disk. So it seems yes. like it's all happening on different scales. And I guess like asteroids or moons going around the planets would be even smaller pebbles. Exactly. So it's the same exact sorts of processes at work at different scales that are giving rise to similar phenomena. Right. Okay, great. So my next question is, once Earth has formed as a planet, how did life come to be? So what what is special about Earth and its conditions that made it appropriate for life to develop? And how might life have originally sparked? That's one thing I've personally never, never really known, like, how the process got going in the first place? This is a, a very good question, one that could go on for a lifetime, really. The, the first side of it is what makes a planet habitable, or that is to say, has the conditions that could potentially support life. So this is mm. the first part of the question before we say, how did life actually arise? And when we think about this in the context of just planetary environments in general, you can pin a few particular um characteristics on a certain planet as being vital to being able to support life. Uh, One that jumps to the top of the list usually is the fact that Earth, as far back as we can see in the geologic record, has had liquid water persisting on its surface. And what that tells us is, well, first of all, that water is the preferred uh, solvent in which all of life's reactions occur. Um, But in order for it to have been persisting on Earth's surface environment, it means that we had a relatively stable climate uh, for billions of years, in fact. And so 
when we talk about making a planet habitable or suitable for having life develop on it, uh, one thing that jumps to the top of many lists is that we want to be able to have a stable climate that can support liquid water on the surface of a planet. Um, so that, amongst other things, perhaps, is uh, something that enabled the Earth, as opposed to other planets, to uh, become a place where life could arise, evolve, diversify, and so on. But other planets seem to have some water. I think we found that Mars now has a decent amount. Um, I think they. I think I even like, like a week or two ago they found that even the Moon might have some That's trace amounts. Exactly right. Actually, this is a, a perfect time to be discussing this question because just in the last few months there have been these exciting discoveries of water in various forms uh, on the both the Moon and Mars. Um, so this is a very good comparison for understanding why the earth looks like it does the hmm. blue planet covered in oceans teeming with life and mars which in many respects we think is a dead planet uh, that's not to say we can prove that there is or is not life uh, with the available evidence but it's clearly at least not teeming with a vibrant ecosystem such as earth's and the obvious difference when you look at the surface of mars today is that it is not flooded with oceans like the earth is but you're right, there is some water there today. And actually what that water that's there today tells us, both in analyses of the actual composition of the H2O or of the isotopic composition of the hydrogen and the oxygen on uh, Mars, but also through other pieces of evidence, like morphological evidence on the surface, uh, they all tell us that there was quite a bit more water on Mars when it was a young planet a few billion years mm. ago. And so that raises an important question that it's not just enough to have had liquid water, but what does it take to keep your oceans on a planet? And there are two possible things that make Mars in that respect very different from the Earth. The first obvious one that you can just notice um, by looking at the two planets is that Mars is quite a bit smaller. Hmm. Uh, it has on the, It's on the order of one order of magnitude smaller, about 10 times less mass than the Earth. Um, and so it has quite a bit weaker gravitational uh, pull to it. And therefore, it's easier for molecules in the atmosphere, including uh, water vapor, to achieve escape velocity and leave the planet. Um, this can occur when, for instance, uh, meteorites or asteroids enter the atmosphere, energize particles in the atmosphere, and some of those will achieve escape velocity. And this can erode the atmosphere of a planet with it, the oceans, through time. And the second side of that is that perhaps due to its smaller size, Mars does not have an active core like in the center of the Earth where there is a liquid outer core revolving around a solid inner core. And because of the metallic composition of this, it generates a magnetic field. And what Earth's magnetic field does is protects it from the solar wind, which has charged particles emitted from the sun towards Earth that if it weren't for the magnetic field, they would energize particles in the atmosphere and erode them. But because it contacts the magnetic field, the Earth's atmosphere is spared that erosion, whereas Mars is vigorously eroded by the solar wind. And so over a few billion years, the two planets that may have both been habitable early on in their history, Earth and Mars, have very different life stories, whereas Mars seems to have lost most of its water and perhaps lost its ability so, to support life, whereas Earth, to this day, remains a inhabited planet. Hmm. And what's the role of, I've also read that the fact that we have a moon is very beneficial, and also the fact that we have Jupiter is beneficial because Jupiter basically takes a lot of the hits as far as asteroids colliding that might otherwise collide with Earth or or Mars, or other water-bearing planets? Yeah, so these are both um, things that people speculate might contribute to the fact that Earth is not just inhabited, but has been continuously inhabited um, on you know planetary timescales, billion-year timescales. Um, because, like, going back to our image of the, uh, the proto-solar system, this disk of matter swirling together, and these planets forming through accretion of smaller planetesimals, uh, it's a violent place. And in fact, the very impact event that formed our moon was that of the proto-Earth being impacted by a planetesimal about the size of Mars. And so that was an extremely violent wow. event. It, it melted the surface of the Earth 
And that planetesimal became our moon because it got gravitationally trapped by Earth's um, gravitational pull. And that's why it revolves around us today still, but it's moving ever slowly uh, away from the Earth, actually, with time. Um, so in any case, what the, the fact that we have this large moon now can perhaps play a role in gravitationally diverting um, or uh, sorry, having a, a protective role that is on, on Earth. Um, what one way being that it actually stabilizes the Earth's. Um, you can imagine as the Earth orbits and also spins in space, it has a bit of a wobble to it. Hmm. And this is actually just a few degrees. It's a very minor thing if you were to imagine a top wobbling on a, a tabletop. Um, but that's actually enough to in recent past, in the last two million years, can get us into and out of ice ages, just these small little wiggles. And if it weren't for the gravitational effect of a large moon, we would perhaps have much larger wiggles. It would, in that sense, perhaps give us much more dramatic climate fluctuations, which might not be good for uh, the longevity of life on the planet. So it is possible that the large moon is an important piece right. of the puzzle. I mean, it's interesting. It seems like so much of life on Earth is tied with the moon. You know, when you think about the tide or you think about, you know, female reproductive cycles, I mean, so much of it. It's almost like I wonder what would happen in the short term if you had like a giant spaceship knock the moon off orbit. Would that like wreak havoc on humans in like the near term or would it would we pretty much be OK until some asteroid came and then we're not protected? You know, luckily, I think it would be difficult with the technologies that I think are reasonably available to us now and in the near future to actually get the moon considerably out of its current orbit around the Earth. Um so unlike, for instance, what we could do potentially to asteroids that are headed for Earth, if we catch these right. early enough on at a great enough distance, we do actually have the technology, the capability of redirecting those such that they do not hit the Earth. But when you're very far away with a much, much smaller object, it's actually easier to cause a very minute deflection that actually when you add that up across you know, the angle um, – integrated across the whole distance it's traveling from that point to the earth it would perhaps miss the earth by right. quite space. yeah so we, we should talk about that when we talk about the destruction of earth but let's say just for argument's sake because i think it's interesting if there was like a superior civilization that was able to knock the moon completely out of earth's orbit do you think that that would like have significant adverse effects on humanity and other earthlings or do you think we would pretty much be okay except for the protection aspect you know if it were theoretically possible to near more or less instantaneously remove the moon from its its position i don't know that it would have an instantaneous effect on our climate stability um on you know a human time scale of uh, weather time scales but once you even start to get to short-term climate, once you're probably in the hundreds to thousands of years, then I think you would easily start to see some effect, and the severity of which I, I can't uh, guess to yet. But I just for reference, will say that even the tiny wobble in the Earth's orbit that happens in the presence of the moon is enough to put us into an ice age where there's one mile of ice sitting above New York City and wow. out of that to the to pr the present day, um, so it would it would have some more effects. severe than that. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It seems like we're at this equilibrium that's very tenuous, and yet it's been relatively stable across time. And and we we should talk about the Gaia hypothesis, but but first we should get back to the first part of the or the second part of that question earlier, which is. How do you think or how do scientists uh, hypothesize that life first came to be on Earth? So we have Earth that has all of these conditions that are perfect for life to form. But how does that seed initially get sown? Yes, well, that's perhaps the million dollar question that one could ask. What is 
the mechanism of the origin of life. Um, so I can't claim to have an answer for you, but what I can do is point out and discuss something about different theories that people have proposed. Um, and some common threads of all of these are the fact that, like we've discussed already, there was liquid water present on the surface of the Earth nearly as far back as we can find evidence for. In fact, even older than the oldest rocks on the planet, there are minerals that contain hints of the fact that there was liquid water interacting with crust, um, essentially right after the Earth formed. So if you take that there is water present, um, people try to come up with these models of what the atmosphere is made of. Uh, this is based on some empirical constraints, other just theoretical arguments. And one of the, actually the most seminal things that was done to extend this concept of a potentially habitable Earth to a mechanism for the origin of life was to try to create those conditions in the lab, take what we thought the composition of the atmosphere was, that is next to no oxygen in contrast to today, but there is nitrogen in that atmosphere and it was a, as opposed to oxidizing environment like we have today, a reducing environment. You introduce these gases that are thought to be in the atmosphere and you introduce a little bit of energy in the form of lightning perhaps. Uh, and in fact, this is what this is a famous experiment called it's named after its uh, designers, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey at the University of Chicago, the Miller Urey synthesis. Basically, they did this experiment, ran it for a few weeks in their lab, and were able to generate simply by abiotically zapping this theoretical early Earth atmosphere with some uh, lightning. They synthesized many of the amino acids that are found in our biomass to this day wow. uh, in addition to nucleobases that are part of our DNA and so on and so forth and a range of other organic molecules. So it seems not that hard to at least get the building blocks, the basic building blocks built right. with just a little bit of warmth, a little bit of water, a little bit of organic matter. I can't help but think of Zeus hurling lightning bolts at different planets, impregnating yeah. those planets with life. <laughs> you know it's a different metaphor but it's really essentially the same storyline if you look at it that way or from this uh miller yuri synthesis point of view right it also reminds me of i don't know if you saw the movie life where it's it's kind of a no. horror movie sci-fi horror but it's with ryan reynolds and basically they find some complex life on mars in one of their probes and they take it back to the lab and they're trying to make it grow so they can study it because it's in this like um, it's basically like in a coma almost. I don't know what the scientific term for that would be, but they try. They're like, OK, let's try the early Earth. And so then they have all of the different, um, you know, all the different chemical compositions and everything. And then they're like, OK, that didn't work. And then they try a couple other environments and then finally it grows. But it does seem very much like playing God when you are, you know, when you can have the right conditions and zap a little energy into it and get something that was previously not alive to be alive. And of course, the question of what does it even mean to be alive is, is also a difficult one to answer. You know, what's yes. the difference between biotic and abiotic matter? I mean, it's all the same building blocks. So what's even going on there? Exactly. And that's really the threshold that's being discussed when people ask how life got going on our planet and potentially on others. They're confronting this transition from what we would define as abiotic to something we would define as biotic uh, matter. And when you break it down and realize that, yes, it's the same matter and the same chemical and physical principles applying to both, um, it sort of makes it, on the one hand, difficult to define what life is, but on the other hand, opens up this view of life not so much as a, a noun, as a thing, as a stuff, but rather as a verb, rather mm. as a type of process. And this is sort of scientifically phrased um, in the sense that life is defined in our best attempts, not just as organic carbon of certain building blocks and this and that, but it also has to undergo Darwinian evolution, that is, evolution by natural selection. Um, and so that threshold, which people sometimes refer to as the Darwinian threshold, is perhaps what we would call the origin of life. Right. So it's not to say 
that some new type of matter was necessarily invented. But at a certain point, what was purely what we would call chemical experimentation reached a point where the system, the whole system, was then subject to this sort of natural selection. Right. It almost reminds me of the von Neumann probes, which is this thought experiment where if you can just put out one probe that is able to take molecules and build another version of itself, which then that new version builds another version, and it keeps going until basically the whole universe is full of these von Neumann probes. It's, it's almost like how life is. I mean, you get, once you get the first cell, living cell, that can split into two, and then those split even further, become more complex, and then you have more complex life forms creating more of themselves, and, and you know who knows where this crescendo is leading towards. But I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the process of life, like what are the fundamental components of how life develops, and then how is that different from what we consider to be man-made? Because that's another part that, that has always confused me is when people say, oh, this is man-made, it's, it's terrible what we're doing to the earth. But then it's like, wait a minute, we are the earth. Like we are nature. Like for us to think that we're not nature almost seems hubristic where it's like we're separate from everything else. So, and, but it does seem like we're able to affect changes much more rapidly than was possible in the past through what scientists, many of them, assume to be an unconscious um, process. So I guess, like, what are your thoughts on how, what drives life and whether that process is unconscious or conscious and how that differs from the process of humans coding new algorithms, let's say? Yeah, that's, it's a very um, contentious topic, perhaps. So I think there's some understandable need scientifically to pin something as being life or not when we'd say do things like search for life on other planets. Mm -hmm. We need to have a clear definition of it is this, it is not that, this is what we're looking for, so that we know whether we're successful or not. And so usually what people are talking about there is something that you can yeah, an operational definition of life that includes features like is made of organic carbon, reproduces, undergoes uh, evolution by natural selection, amongst other things, uh, and utilizes an energy source, basically maintains internal order by mm. consuming energy and excreting low-grade waste products. Uh, that is, moves uphill, essentially. Uh, so it's like combating energy. entropy, basically, to keep itself yes. in order. To keep itself going. And those are some of the pillars of what people would define as a biological system. Uh, but again, when you start to then extrapolate that into something that is clearly human-made, that is, we tinkered with it, um, it becomes tricky because, yes, you, on the one hand, you're right. You can't say that it's not a living thing if it's if it's something that's growing, evolving, reproducing. Uh, for instance, like a computer virus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and all, many you know, named because it does behave so much like a, a virus of the organic sort. Um, this doesn't really fall under the same scientific scrutiny because we aren't at a point where we need to define that in order to do these sorts of exploration. Uh, and so that really is something that's not well uh, decided upon. It, it sort of, you'll get different answers when you talk to different people. I think the, the simplest thing to say is that it is clearly analogous sorts of processes um, that are shaping the evolution of see, technological entities, just like biological, organic, you know, uh, messy muddy entities that we're used to calling life so right i don't know that i can come up with a clear answer as to where i would draw that threshold but you're right it is an interesting question yeah so i think this leads right into the gaia hypothesis because that seems to be the main alternate theory aside from this process occurring randomly like as dawkins would have it so I guess to just explain briefly to people who are listening, the Gaia hypothesis basically states that humans, all life, everything on Earth is essentially 
maintaining itself through one collective process. I mean, I don't know if that's a good way of explaining it, but but basically, oh, it's almost it doesn't quite go as far as to say the earth is conscious, but it does say that the earth maintains its own order so that it continues to be habitable for life. And to me, like as as someone who, you know, just loves Alan Watts and and loves thinking about the bigger picture versus the smaller picture where people, you know, scientists uh, for many decades, centuries, they would always look at things on a smaller and smaller scale. Like what are the building blocks that are smaller and smaller and trying to find like a bottom up approach. But there's no real good reason to think that it's a bottom up approach where it's like quanta control everything any more than planets control anything it's like they're all sort of just different scales so the idea that we are all part of the earth in the same way that apple trees are part of the earth and the only thing that's really different about us is that we're not bound to the ground through our roots we can walk around and we can even take a canned version of earth's atmosphere in the form of a spaceship off of earth and go on a little vacation But then some pretty bad things happen to our biological system and we got to come back to Mother Earth. I think it it, it makes a ton of sense to me to say that Earth, in the same way that we are conscious, in the same way that I would argue my dogs are conscious and other beings on, that Earth itself is um, is maintaining order so that it can continue to be habitable for life. So I guess my question to you is, I think first, it's, in, it's important to see how does the scientific community view this? And then how do you view this? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot there. I think a good place to start tackling that question uh, is, is where you began, which is the notion that there is some regulation of the Earth's state. Uh, biological, climatic, just general planetary state by the living aspects of it. This this is the foundation of this Gaia hypothesis that was really shaped oh, and put forth by James Lovelock a few decades ago, but it's been reshaped and wrestled with by many people since because it's a challenging idea. I think in lieu of, instead of actually trying to um, pin an, an actual teleological, that is a, a purpose-driven um, hmm. uh, um, uh, character. Like an, it's like a North Star Earth. goal, is what yes. I mean, in, in marketing in, terms. Well, yes, in, in those terms, yes. So the, that was one of the biggest knocks against the hypothesis in the first place, is that that's a non-scientific approach to say that there is an end mean cause. Um, it's it's not a testable hypothesis. Therefore, we we have no place considering it scientifically. But if you disregard that aspect of it and you just say, is the Earth regulating itself as a planet? We clearly know that, like we discussed before, there is a maintenance of these habitable conditions throughout Earth's history by some mechanisms. Now, people debate over what they are, whether they are these geological mechanisms, these biological, uh, these pure luck, astronomical happenstance that we're in the right place at the right time. Um, Clearly, some sequence of events led the Earth to be continuously inhabited for billions of years. An interesting way of looking at that is a sort of repurposed version of this this Gaia hypothesis idea, actually, which took a similar name um, uh, in a paper a couple years ago which refers to this, uh, basically, this threshold or this bottleneck, a Gaian bottleneck, basically, in which planets either develop life or they don't, for reasons like we discussed, uh, like on the early Earth, if the conditions were in- conducive to life, was there liquid water, was that maintained, was there an energy source, protection from uh, harmful radiation, this and that. And then... Whatever happens on that planet, whether it gets life or not, it needs to then undergo a billions of years long planetary history, and it will either regulate its climate in such a way that it stays inhabited, or it won't. 
And basically, like Mars, for instance, there may have been many planets that had the right conditions for life, perhaps even had life on them, perhaps even had flourishing life on them, but didn't maintain those conditions for billions mm. of years, whereas only some, like the Earth, do, in fact, maintain it. And so in that sense, the only planets that would sustain life for a long time, by definition, sort of, would had to have had mechanisms in place to regulate that their climate, their planetary state, what have you. And so that almost gives way to this emergence of whatever you would like to call it, um, some set of regulatory pathways that basically keep planets inhabited. Um, and yes, it, it clearly plays an important role in, in understanding better how those actually played out in Earth's past is, is one of the uh, important things that needs to be done to actually see how much that applies to other planets. Right. And, and I read the, the book by James Lovelock after, I think you actually were the one who initially may have recommended it to me some like four years ago or something, but there's very good evidence that he notes in the book that is pretty compelling. Like for instance, the fact that the, the level of salinity of salt in the ocean has stayed at about 3.4% for as long as we've pretty much been measuring it, even though it should be much saltier by now based on our calculations. So something's going on where the salt is being deposited in a way so that it doesn't get too salty, so that it's, it's bad for life. There's also evidence as far as uh, temperature levels, where the temperature of the Earth's ocean has never been too hot or too cold since life began. And it seems like there is some self-regulating process, almost like a thermostat in your apartment, where basically if the earth is too cold, like after the ice age, more organic more, or more organisms that, that emit CO2, like humans, come onto the scene to sort of warm it up a little bit. Likewise, if it's becoming uh, too hot, then they have more like trees that come on and, and cool it down a little bit. Um, so it seems like it seems like the evidence is that it's not evolving at random, and it seems like it would be way too lucky for us to have made it this far without it. You know, there's no doubt that there are these regulatory mechanisms, and in fact, actually, the most famous one that um, is basically textbook knowledge at this point um, relates to the regulation of Earth's temperature on geological timescales that is on greater than million year, so up to billion year timescales. Um, and this is through what we call the carbonate silicate weathering feedback. What this basically means is that the Earth's greenhouse effect today is dominated by CO2, carbon dioxide. More CO2 in the atmosphere means stronger greenhouse effect, warmer climate, less CO2, colder climate. And if we were to maintain long-term stasis in the climate system, then what we need is a mechanism that keeps CO2, just like you were saying, it, like a thermostat keeps it at the right level. And again, a few decades ago, actually after Lovelock wrote that book, um, this was proposed basically as a mechanism for regulating CO2, which is that when you have higher CO2 levels and warmer climates, uh, you actually are able to more effectively weather the crust of the Earth, which is a, a sink. It, it, it takes up CO2, basically. It consumes CO2. And so you're drawing CO2 down from the atmosphere more effectively when you have more of it in the atmosphere. And that gets actually buried in marine sediments, and it can ultimately actually get uh, recycled back into Earth's mantle, so away from the crust even. Uh, and then, likewise, uh, the flip side of that is true, where when you have colder climates and you actually are consuming less CO2 during weathering, um, just very simple models originally showed that this could explain stability in carbon dioxide levels on long time skills. And it still to this day is thought to actually be the dominant mechanism that keeps Earth inhabited, whereas other planets, perhaps, that do not have that sort of a feedback in place, um, right. which are unable to basically put that carbon out of the atmosphere and into the crust, ultimately the mantle, 
um, perhaps like Venus, they will reach a runaway state where they can't sustain life anymore because they've gotten too far to one extreme. In Venus's case, too much CO2 and it's too hot. Right. So it, it seems like a scientific theory that has a decent amount of evidence. There's a lot of reasons to believe that this is a theory worth exploring more. I think part of why it's so controversial is how it relates to global climate change and what humans should or should not do in response to that. So, you know, even James Lovelock himself has has sort of hinted at the fact that Earth is maintaining its own stasis for life's habitability. Therefore, we don't really need to do much in the way of changing what's happening, especially when you consider the fact that we ourselves are the Earth. We are Earthlings. We are the process by which the Earth maintains its stasis. Therefore, to think that it's like, oh, we're destroying the Earth is almost like a weird question or, or weird statement to have because it's like, well, we are the Earth. We are the mechanism by which Earth um, maintains itself. And, I, you know, some interesting thoughts around that are one thing is, yeah, maybe the Earth is optimizing for habitability of life and it's maintaining that habitability. But some forms of life go extinct, like the dinosaurs and humans might go extinct. And then it might be the age of the cockroach for thousands of years. And then something else might happen that we would some new crazy species like super intelligent cockroach overlords that, you know, can see through walls or, you know, who knows? Um, so that's another interesting point. And then it, the, the final point I'll make is that it almost seems similar to me to the Sam Harris argument where there's no free will, where it's almost kind of like look, this is happening regardless. It's almost kind of like a, like a hive mind where, yes, we all have a sense, like we, we all can recognize that there are different ways that it seems like we could have done things. But in reality, there are no, there's, you only could have done things the way that you end up doing them given all of the conditions in the environment. So like, for instance, if I was to ask you to think of a vegetable, so like what, what vegetable did you just think of? Asparagus. Asparagus. So why, why did you think of asparagus? Did you eat that last night or something? No. So yeah, so for whatever reason that's unbeknownst to you, you thought of asparagus. So to say that you had the free will to think of some obscure vegetable like jicama, like what does that even mean? Like, oh, I had the free will to think. It's like things are, we're, we're sort of along for the ride and we can analyze things in 2020 retrospect, but it doesn't seem like, like we have free will in the sense that many other situations can have happened given the same set of conditions. So it yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, it's, it's almost like a circular, I mean, I don't know how to get out of this philosophical, you know, circular motion is a dangerous loop i again to get back to what you began that um point with the i think it's a dangerous loop to find ourselves in when it comes to discussing action related to a changing climate in which we live um because like you said you can throw out these statements like oh the earth regulates its climate and all oh, humans are just one of many species um doesn't the earth take care of itself hasn't it maintained a habitable condition for itself and for humans and so why do we need to do anything actively to manage the climate um to that i guess i have two two points i'd make the first is that it is true that the earth is not being destroyed as a as a planet by humans we are what we're doing is we're making the environment perhaps very unlivable for us Right. And also very unlivable for many other organisms, unfortunately, that are species that are going extinct at an alarming rate. But that's not to say that the Earth does not have the resilience to recover from the infection of humans. Uh, it very likely does. It's actually seen probably much worse in terms of uh, mass extinctions, at least. Um, maybe I shouldn't speak too soon. But in any case, what we're concerned with, this is my second point, is maintaining a climate and an environment that's livable for us because right. that's really what matters here and so when we talk about actively managing climate or caring about uh, 
you know, seeing to the the future being the most uh, clement and least extreme sort of climate and weather regime that we could uh, uh, enact, we're doing so because we want to continue human civilization as we understand it. We don't want to be faced with a, a sort of climate crisis or something like that. And so I think, yeah, what we're doing there is not, again, the planet that is in the fact that the, this idea that the planet would some you know, disintegrate or something if we weren't watching out for it. It's rather to make sure things like air quality is not so bad that we can't breathe, or the drought is not so severe that people can't have water, or the fires aren't so bad that they impinge on human uh, crops and civilization and uh, you know, societies, um, that weather events aren't so extreme that they flood major cities, um, right. things like that. So, and what do you make of the things. what do you make of the fact that some humans? have in their deepest hearts this need and desire to protect the environment and to combat the efforts of, of the oil and coal industries and to really be these these warriors for against global climate change and for the habitability of the planet, specifically, as you say, for humans and other creatures that we find lovable, like dogs and cats. And while other human beings like Scott Pruitt just couldn't give a shit. <laughs> I mean, it's because it, we are all earthlings. So it's it's an interesting dynamic where some earthlings are very for changing the climate in a way that's beneficial to us and others just don't care in what direction it changes. And they just they just want to make a short term profit and they don't really care what happens. Yeah, it seems to be a philosophical divide of really what you identify with as you know, what is it that you want to perpetuate? Um, and so whatever your answer to that question is will dictate perhaps your view on what you're willing to think and do about the, the future of the climate. And so if the priority is simply looking at business as usual and human progression as we understand it, then you could conceivably look past climate. Um, on the other hand, if you actually look at, in a long-term perspective and you simply are, again, even just acting out of selfishness for yourself and for a larger uh, you know, business or economic entity, you then at that point might need to take into effect climate because you realize that that's the world you will have to live in in you know, decades to centuries. Um, and then in the most extreme case, maybe there's a detachment of you know, perpetuating oneself and one's own species even. Um, where you see people part of an environmental movement that is almost, if not a, a human, almost anti-human in the sense mm. of it, it uh, views our effects on the environment as deleterious um, and says that perhaps what the Earth is trying to do is, in fact, do away with us and it will come up with some other biological experiments after we're gone. And so there's it's a whole spectrum. I think it comes down to people picking something that they want to uh, perpetuate, to put their energy into continuing. So, But maybe they don't even pick it consciously. It's just part of their nature that's bestowed upon them by Mother Earth or whatever. And we'll just sort of see how it plays out. In that sense, it is interesting to, you know, everyone is, in, a, in many respects, the product of his or her environment. And so... Um, yeah, what I think you hit the nail on the head. The interesting thing, the telling thing, will be the what actually emerges and takes place on the planetary scale, and that's really the interesting question that we're after here: is what is the future of um, not just human life on the planet, and not just the climate of the planet, but the future of all life on on Earth? Right. And what, as a biological planet, what will it look like in a hundred, a thousand, a million, one billion years? Yeah, so that's the perfect segue, I think. So we've talked about how Earth came to be. We've talked about how Earth has developed both as far as evolution and as far as mankind's influence specifically on the Earth. Now let's move into how we think the Earth or what evidence there is for how the Earth will develop going forward from now until Earth ceases to exist. And, you know, part two is going to focus on humans that have left earth and what might happen to civilizations beyond planet earth but there's reason to believe that for as long as earth is habitable there's going to be some cohort of humans that will stay on the earth for as long as we're around so so i guess like first in just the most high level broad strokes 
how do you see the earth going from where it is now until its inevitable destruction? Well, it's a very difficult question to answer, and so I will take the easy way out and discuss the things that we can't avoid that simply are right. essentially That's a, a good place to start. programmed yeah. uh, into the type of planet and solar system that we live on and in. So um, for one thing, well, maybe we can work backwards. The end of the Earth as we know it today is the beautiful, moist, wet, dry, warm, cold, basically diverse and inhabited uh, and clement environment that we have today will come to an end inevitably at some point within on the order of four to five billion years. Now, it's quite a long time. That's about the age of the Earth itself. Um, but that will be marked by the stage in our star's evolution when the sun actually expands uh, to the point where it encroaches on and eventually engulfs the Earth um, as it, the diameter of the sun drastically expands. So that we have you know a few billion years until we get to that point. Um, to say what happens between now and then it would be wildly speculative. But we can work a ways back from that and basically say that, okay, what do we know about where the climate is headed, uh, geologically speaking? In, in what context do we exist, basically? Um, let's let's jump quite a bit shorter. Let's jump to million-year time scales here. In the last, like I said before, two million years, we've been in these glacial interglacial cycles that oscillate, right. that are basically enabled by uh, these small wiggles in the Earth's tilt, basically, uh, as it as it spins, um, this obliquity uh, procession and basically can give rise to yeah these massive climatic changes. And we have no reason to suspect that those would not continue with some regularity if we left everything untouched, if we didn't start changing the thermostat, basically. Now, the question is, have we changed the thermostat enough or have we pushed enough buttons that it's not going to keep doing that uh, in the next million years. Um, some people actually think, uh, actually maybe a lot of people think, that it is too late, at least for the next ice age. The, the, by some calculations, now that it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, but in state-of-the-art climate models that account for the fate of all of the carbon we've injected into the atmosphere, um, it seems like it is enough already that we have basically done away with the next ice age in that cycle. Um, hmm. Now, that wouldn't take place for tens of thousands of years anyways. Um, but under business as usual or even a, a, an ameliorated emission scenario, it's very conceivable, if not likely, that, okay, that is a climatic change we would face. Now, right, even, yeah, I have here that in the next 50,000 years, that's when the next glacial period is predicted to occur, mm -hmm. assuming we haven't already emitted enough CO2 to prevent that from happening. Yes, so that's really the big question, is what is the fate of the CO2 that we have already put in the atmosphere? And so just, just for reference, the last ice age, the amount of CO2, the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere was about 180 parts per million. Then rapidly, in a matter of a few thousand years, that number shot up to 260 to 280 parts per million. And that change of 80 to 100 parts per million was enough to get us from the glacial climate to the Holocene, basically the sort of climate in which we live, uh, or what we call the pre-industrial climate. Then, mm -hmm. so that, that took thousands of years. That was a natural um, sequence of events that was induced by these orbital uh, variations and amplified by these feedbacks involving greenhouse gas levels like CO2. Now, keep that number in mind, 180 to 280, because so 280 was about the level of CO2 in the atmosphere when humans started industrializing. This is into the 1800s. And if you were to go today out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and do what actually is being done every single day that has been happening for four decades now, measuring the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, 
you'd see that it's greater than 400 parts per million, which is larger. It's actually, since 1800, we have had a larger increase already than the increase from the last ice age to modern climate. And we've done that in a century, not a few millennia. Wow. So that's what has people concerned. Right. It's like the rate of change right now is so drastic that, I mean, looking out a million years, even though that's so short on the geological time scales, it's hard to imagine us not having royally screwed things up by then. Yeah. So it's really, again, a matter of what it means for our own society persisting, because Yes, maybe it's true that this is a perturbation. Uh, the magnitude relative to the time, it just may create a situation that's very hard for humans to live in because it's very hard for us to predict uh, what exactly it's going to do to the climate system. This is the uh, ongoing challenge of climate science today. And the reason why we have such things as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that brings together minds of people across every you know, continent and many countries putting together the most comprehensive model we can of the way that the climate system behaves. And we still can't quite agree on what the fate of the temperature, the sea level, and this and that will be. Uh, on the one hand, because we don't know what humans will do in terms of how we will change our behavior or not. Uh, but on the other hand, because of unknowns and how the climate system actually operates. And so um, it's almost easier to look at the very long term and make predictions projections about, uh, like we were saying, the, the next ice age, will it come or not? That's almost an easier calculation than saying how much sea level rise or how much temperature increase by 2100. Right. So I know we're running a little short on time. So I want to get into the worst case, best case, and most likely scenarios for how the earth and how life on earth will develop from now until, until it for sure is going to be gone. So, I mean, one, you know, something that I found is that in 1 billion years, the sun's luminosity will have increased by 10% so that the average temperature on earth will be 117 degrees Fahrenheit, which will lead to the world's oceans evaporating away. And some of the last pockets of life would be in the poles where like the last bits of water might be trapped. So like, Let's say a billion years is the end of, you know, no, pretty much no matter what we do, that's when the earth, all life on earth is going to be gone. So looking at, you know, considering that and then considering, let's say in the year 2045, that's the year that Ray Kurzweil predicts the singularity will occur. And it's, you know, other AI scientists agree with that sort of a time frame, which is pretty much exactly double our lifespan. You know, you and I are well, you're 26, right? You're 27. 25. Are you only 25? Okay, so it's well for me, it's double my lifespan will be when the singularity is predicted to occur in the year 2045. Um, so let's say let's take those as the two big um, ends, like the beginning and the end, because I think those really are two of the biggest parameters. What do you think? Let's start with the worst case scenario. <laughs> What well, do you think the worst case scenario is? Again, since I'm in no position to speculate on the technological aspect of this worst case scenario, uh, in terms of climate system, basically, what people, this is actually an exercise that's done by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. When they put together their projections, they have, they don't necessarily call them best case, worst case, but they have these various scenarios basically relating to the extent to which we do or do not change our uh, level of carbon emissions. So in the worst case scenarios that they consider viable, um, they feature not just an increase, oh, not just a maintenance of the amount of CO2 emission that we have today, but actually an increase as more countries grow their economies and develop and so right. on and so forth. Um, that features pretty dramatic temperature changes and sea level changes, even by the end of the century. Um, now, yeah, the the numbers of which I don't personally uh, I can't conjure up off the top of my head, but what we're talking about there is a few degrees Celsius difference, mm. which may not sound like much globally averaged. Um, now, what that would mean for the 
for humanity, I think, would come down to more regional effects. Uh, again, so like we're already seeing with drought in some parts of the world, water resources being a very important piece of the puzzle, uh, and sea level rise in large cities that are very close to sea level. Um, Venice, New York, Amsterdam, New Orleans, you know, the uh, uh, astonishing proportion of the world's population, not just in those cities I mentioned, but in many uh, developing countries, in fact, lives within, uh, you know, 10 meters or many, a huge proportion within 100 meters of sea level. And so um, those are vulnerable spots. So worst case is we continue carbon emissions. Uh, we, in fact, increase them with time and we steadily increase the temperature and the climate and we acidify the ocean and it... Uh, it becomes increasingly unlivable for humans. Right. But when the crisis point is, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, even like I've seen that all of the Hawaiian islands will be submerged under the ocean 80 million years from now. <laughs> and by that time, all of the Grand Canyon will have basically eroded away. I mean, it's amazing how much, how much things change once you look on those larger timescales. But for me, the worst case scenario would be a much more near term catastrophe. So, I mean, obviously, at any given point, nuclear war can lead to the end of, of humanity. At any given point, a rogue black hole could come and destroy all of us. Well, by the way, would we have any way of, of, of noticing a black hole if it was about to get us? And I mean, we pretty much couldn't do anything, right? Well, I, to my knowledge, I'm not an astrophysicist, but we are able to detect the presence of such things, and it seems that it seems unlikely that we would be, uh, so to speak, attacked by one, let alone um, intentionally brought to an end at the hands of a black hole. So that one, I think we're, I think we're safe on. Right. As I speak too soon. Okay. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> I've also read that the reversal of Earth's magnetic fields is a possibility. It is, yes, uh, an interesting question. Um, so, like we discussed before, the fact that Earth has a magnetic field is very important for the persistence of life on the surface. It protects us from the solar wind, these uh, you know, charged energetic particles that are being hurled towards our planet by the sun. Um, if we were to just have no magnetic field, then it would, well, not only be harmful to us, the, the creatures, in the form of uh, basically high energy particles hitting us, inducing mutations, perhaps leading to higher incidence rates of cancers and these sorts of things. Uh, it would also wreak havoc on our telecommunications network. Hmm. So the reason people are concerned about these reversals is that there are these known events in Earth's past um, where... In fact, our magnetic field, which, like all magnets, is a, a polar entity. It has a north and a south pole. Ours being a dipole, so it's, it's basically a, a linear um, field uh, vector. And there are times in the Earth's past where we know that the orientation was actually the opposite of what it is today. And you can actually see on the seafloor these clear vertical stripes um, of looking at older and older seafloor and the, mag the magnetization of these uh, iron-bearing minerals in there actually, on not perfectly regular, but on some intervals, flips back and forth and back and forth. So you know right. there's this possibility the magnetic field can reverse. And when doing so, it's likely that it would not be instantaneous in a human uh, time frame, that is to say, you know, split seconds. Right. Uh, and so how, whatever the time frame of that transition would be, it might lead to a time where our protective magnetic field was not stable or even present. And so we would be perhaps uh, at the whim of some stellar and uh, cosmic radiation at that point. Right. So that might not be the worst case scenario, given that it takes a while for it to, to, um, perhaps to come onto we... the scene. So it seems like, okay, some other possibilities for worst case scenario, a nearby supernova a gamma ray burst, aliens destroying us once we achieve the singularity, because at that point we actually become somewhat of a threat to them. 
an asteroid hitting us, a global academic epidemic, nuclear war. I mean, these are all possibilities. So I don't know which one is necessarily the worst. I mean, I think in, in a lot of cases you could make the argument for either aliens or AI destroying us being the worst because they could do crazy technological things like create simulations where we live in torturous hell for all eternity in multiple instances of our consciousness. But that's not the most likely. So next, I think let's just briefly go over the, the best case scenario. So for me, I guess I'll start off the best case scenario would be we pass through the singularity with flying colors. So in the year 2045 or sometime thereabouts, we are able to effectively merge biotech with infotech such that we are able to affect our future to a degree that has never been possible before. And with that emergence of technology, we're able to solve a lot of the problems that we're talking about. So we're able to basically help the earth. And this may go back to the Gaia hypothesis. Maybe Gaia has been planning all along for us to become smart enough that we merge with machines that we can really help maintain a, a beneficial future for earth and, and for all of life in the long term. And through that technology, we're able to prevent catastrophes like asteroids. We're able to reverse global warming. We're able to predict when a magnetic shift is about to happen. We're able to map out all of the rogue black holes, all of the you know solar uh, flares or gamma ray bursts or supernovas or anything else that could potentially be an existential threat. And because of that, we're able to maintain life up until, at least until, let's say, let's say 800 million years from now, which is, you know, from, from what I've read, is basically at the point at which all complex life must die because photosynthesis will no longer be possible based on where the sun will be at that time. So I think for me, that's the best case scenario where we are able to survive for 800 million years leveraging AI. Do you, do you pretty much concur with that or do you have a better case scenario? I think it's pretty hard to top those uh, things you laid out there. I was going to settle for a much milder better, uh, best case, which basically would just mean that we actually reduce our environmental impact to the point where it is sustainable uh, hmm. for our persistence which is essentially what you were getting at. So I'd have to say you said it better than I. So let's do the most likely, and that'll be one of the last things we discuss. So for me, the most likely would be something actually, actually kind of similar to your best case scenario, <laughs> which is that we're able to, but actually maybe not quite as optimistic as your best case scenario. So let's say that we are able to take the appropriate steps to combat the worst effects of global climate change so that Earth maintains habitable. But we're not able to do this forever. We basically delay the impacts of climate change. And eventually, it is going to be ca catastrophic, maybe not for all humans, but for many humans and for many other life forms. And that basically, we're going to come to a situation where the elite, the, the global elite, and maybe even the upper middle class, like, you know, we'll, we'll see how many people are able to, to uh, adopt this system, but there will be some sort of new system where, just like how in Saudi Arabia, you can go skiing in these indoor, air-conditioned, artificially constructed mega complexes, there will be artificially constructed mega complexes that are able to basically keep out any of the adverse effects of climate change, increased radiation, pollution, bad air quality, whatever else. And that, yeah, the whole earth won't be doing great, but we'll have these bastions of hope in the form of giant mega complexes that are essentially their own ecosystem that have been designed in a similar way to what we would consider the ideal ecosystem for earth. Well, I, I would take that as the most likely case uh, in the long, long run. Right. Um, well, the, sorry, it's mo most like I would take that. I would be happy with that being 
actually the most likely case in the long, long run. You think I'm too optimistic? Um, what? <laughs> I The only thing I would add is that in the, the near term, I think given the just the way it's gone in the past with the, the rhetoric and the relationship between the presentation of new evidence for the status of the changing climate versus the level of action taken um uh, short of an astonishing change of of character uh it's setting us up for basically not a pleasant transition but rather forcing us in the form of a a, some sort of crisis at at what scale i don't know but i think it will take some sort of a wake-up call to actually get to a point where we begin to truly curb our environmental footprint as it affects ourselves. So um, I would hope that that's not something so severe as something that would take a a bite out of the human population worldwide, but I do think it will take some sort of very um, difficult uh, situation basically to instigate that action. Right. I mean, even in the year 2042, we're supposed to reach 9 billion people. And I think I read some study that says that with our current resources, we can't support more than maybe 10 billion or, or something thereabouts. So we're going to have to answer some serious questions and overcome some serious challenges even before the climate just, you know, starts to kill everyone. And once climate starts to kill some significant portion of the population, then that's going to lead to wars and strife and other conflicts. And so that, you know, some people may opt to go and live on Mars or live on a giant space station or live in one of these bastions of, of, uh, you know, ecological ideal conditions. So I think that's a good sort of way to cap it off because next episode is when we're going to talk about the future of life beyond Earth. And that's going to explore all of the near term, medium term and long term ways that we are going to leave this planet in search for other planets, how we're going to terraform Mars potentially and what what could happen there. Space tourism, also the Fermi paradox. Why aren't there any other intelligent life forms out there, given how many given that there's more stars just in our solar system than there are you know, grains of sand on Earth. Like, it seems crazy that there are no other intelligent life out there. So what's going on there? And how does life as a whole develop in the worst case, best case, and most likely case, odd infinitum? So even beyond Earth, let's say we could even go beyond the billion years that Earth will be around or be habitable for life. So these are all going to be topics that we're going to be discussing on the next episode of Hence the Future podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Kip, for being on, being a guest on the podcast. And we're going to talk look forward to recording with you next time. What is course, thanks for having me. And what will inevitably happen. The past, the present, hence the 